So we're going to calculate a few more limits here. First one, notice what happens if I do direct substitution. If I plug 1 in for the x's, I'll get 1 over 1 minus 1, which is 0, over 1 minus 1, which is 0. So I have a 0 over 0 case, which is our indeterminate form. So I need to think about ways that I might simplify this. And there's no one way. There's actually a few different options um, for simplifying this. One thing I might do is turn this into a single fraction on top. So I find my common denominator. And I'm going to rewrite this as x minus 1 over 1 because I'm going to flip it and multiply by it. <coughs> so here, now I now have a common denominator. So on top, I'm going to have 1 minus square root of x over square root of x. And when I flip this and multiply, I'm going to have times 1 over x minus 1. Now again, I'm still doing the limit as x goes to 1, so I should keep writing that up front until we actually take the limit. <coughs> so, I have limit as x approaches 1 of 1 minus square root of x over square root of x times x minus 1. Now, a lot of times when we see this, we have the 1 minus rad x, something we might want to try is multiplying by the conjugate. So I might want to multiply by 1 plus square root of x, and you'll see why here in a second. 1 plus square root of x. That radical might be what's causing the issue. So when I go to FOIL that numerator, look at what's going to happen. I got limit as x goes to 1. When I go to FOIL, I got 1 times 1, which is 1. Now notice what happens here. I've got a negative square root of x plus a positive square root of x, so those actually cancel. And now I got negative rad x times a positive rad x, which is actually just a negative x. So that's the new numerator. Denominator's a little bit messy, but we're not going to mess around with it too much right now. x minus 1, and we'll just leave this as 1 plus square root of x for right now. All right. Now, notice this. I have a 1 minus x here and an x minus 1. They're very similar. In fact, all I need to do is factor out a negative 1 on top, so negative 1 times, and I can rewrite that as x minus 1 over, and you can just take a moment to make sure that these two lines are exactly the same, over square root of x times x minus 1 times 1 plus square root of x. Now you may be wondering why did I want to do that. Well, I knew that the x minus 1 in the denominator is part of what was causing the issue, because anytime I plug 1 in for that x, that's getting a zero, and I'm getting a zero in the whole denominator. So if I was going to be able to do this with algebra, I was going to need to be able to cancel this out. Now I can actually go ahead and plug 1 in for my x's and see what I get. So negative 1 over square root of 1 times 1 plus square root of 1. Notice I don't have to write limit out front because I've taken it by plugging in the 1. Square root of 1 is just 1 and I get negative 1 over 2, and there's our limit. Okay, now we're doing the limit as s approaches 1 of f of s, where f of s is given by the piecewise function s, if s is less than 1, 1 minus s, if s is greater than 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at two one-sided limits. We're going to look at the limit as s approaches 1 from the right of f of s, and the limit as s approaches 1 from the left of f of s. If those are equal, we have a limit, and, it, and we're done. If it, they're not equal, then the limit does not exist. So as we approach 1 from the right, we're coming from values that are greater than 1. So we're on this piece right here. The nice thing is this can be solved by a direct substitution. So as s goes to 1, we'll have 1 minus 1, or 0. As we get, as s approaches 1 from the left, that means we're coming in from the left towards 1, so it's coming in from the negative values. Puts us on this piece. Well, as s goes to 1, s is going to be 1. Since those two are not equal, this limit does not exist. If these two had come out to the same value, the limit would exist, and that would be the answer to limit as s approaches 1 of f of s. The last one, we actually are going to see 
in a, later this semester how to do it with calculus, but let's talk about how we do this one right now. Well, as theta goes to zero, if I plug it in, I get zero on top and sine of zero is zero, I get zero on bottom, I get an indeterminate form. Well, let's take a look at this guy with our calculator. So we're going to put in x divided by sine of x, and we should just need a standard window. Remember what we're doing, we're looking for the limit at zero. Let's do a zoom trig. Perhaps we'll see it a little better. So, if we zoom in a little more, You can see that we're getting values out, oh, and excuse me, <laughs> that's why. I was in the wrong mode. <laughs> be sure you don't make the same mistake. You should always be in radian mode. So now let's see if we can get a new, little bit more usual look at this. So where's our zoom trig? Remember that we're looking for the limit as, x, as theta approaches zero. Look how nice the behavior of this thing is at zero. And in fact, it's going to equal one. Now, that doesn't mean this thing exists at zero. If I calculate the, val the value at zero, there is no y value because we're getting zero over zero. But as I approach from the left and the right, I'm going to the same place, which is a y value of one.